supposed to be here. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Let us begin our time of worship this morning as we sing some songs of praise to glorify God. Please stand as you are able. We're going to start with Rise Up and Praise Him. Let the heavens rejoice.
is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. How glorious, how beautiful. The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to see how marvelous, how wonderful you are. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must see.
Examine my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down. You know my every thought when far away. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and where to rest. Every moment you know where I am. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You both receive and follow me. You place your hand and bless me on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too great for me to know. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the place of the dead, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I walk by the Father's ocean. Even there, your hand will guide me, and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me, and the light around me to become none. And even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are both alike to you. You may not be delicate. come from Psalm 139, and we're going to look at that psalm in some depth this morning. But first, let me welcome all of you here. If you're a guest here today, we hope you find this place uh, welcoming and that you will sense God's spirit here and that as the word of God is opened, it will feed your soul. Um, Tonight we continue our Bible study. This is the third installment of four weeks, and we'll be very much in the middle of 1 John. I encourage you to come take advantage of that hour uh, together, actually hour and a half together. Um, a couple other announcements. Vernon Webb's mother is apparently in surgery, 
even as we worship this morning. And we'd ask you to remember them in prayer, that family. Bonnie Lucas has some tests, I think, tomorrow, and she would appreciate your prayers. I think those are all the announcements that I have. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be able to come to your throne of grace not because we're worthy, but because you provided that gracious entrance on the basis of your Son. We thank you, Lord, that you have come to us as a heavenly Father, more willing to give than we are willing to receive. And we thank you, Lord, that you are ever-present and all-powerful and all-knowing, that it is you who formed us in our mother's womb. So we pray that you would search us. In this hour we worship, we pray that you would liberate our minds and hearts to feel your presence searching our souls. For anything that is hurtful or sinful, Anything that is broken, that needs mending. Today, together, we lift up Perverne and Webb's mother. And whatever is happening to her today, for the doctors attending her and the nurses watching her, we pray that the unseen hand of your Holy Spirit would protect her and heal her. For Bonnie Lucas, we ask, Lord, that you would protect her and encourage her throughout the rest of this week and that whatever test she's undergoing would come back in a beneficial way. If there's someone here today who's depressed, we pray for them. There's someone here today, Lord, who is struggling in their marriage. We pray for them. There's someone here that's so tired and weary. Too many demands. We pray, Lord, for them. There's someone here today who knows they've been living far from you. There's someone here today, Lord, who has never come to the cross never had the assurance of sins forgiven. And together we pray for them. We pray for all of us in the light of your love, in the power of your spirit, and in the amazing grace that holds us in the hollow of your hand. And so I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Search me. 
the verses of scripture we're going to focus on are verses 23 and 24 in Psalm 139. And if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to keep them open. But the context of these concluding verses come throughout the psalm. The psalm begins with, You have searched me, O God, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you know my thoughts from afar. Where can I go from your spirit? In heaven you're there, in the depths of Sheol you're there, even if I get on the wings of a dove and travel to the far side of the sea. Even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Throughout the psalm, the writer declares the all-knowing presence and seeing of God. So at the end, he says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts and see if there be <clears throat> some offensive or hurtful or sinful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I want to begin by telling you about Eric and Donna and John and Cindy. They're made up names, but their circumstances are very real. Eric is a 19 year old Christian and his parents are getting divorced leaving his two younger siblings in a state of uncertainty. He's halfway through his sophomore year in college, and he learned that his grandmother, who died recently, left him with $10,000. And a buddy of his invited him to go to Las Vegas and live it up since you're only young once and it might uh, help him now that he's got the money to escape the pain and the drama of his parents divorce but he also needs a new car and 10 grand would be a wonderful down payment however he's also been wanting to start an investment nest egg with an investment a broker friend of his and he also made a commitment to the church's building program and also to sponsor a child in Botswana even though he didn't know where the money was coming from and perhaps this is God's way of providing the money so how is Eric going to figure out the wisest thing to do. Donna is 27 and unmarried, but her boyfriend's about to pop the question and she knows it. Her parents have been married for 38 years and they still love each other. They're still friends. On the other hand, some of her best friends in whose weddings she was a bridesmaid are already divorced and she's afraid because she would really like to have the kind of relationship that her parents have and she's wondering if she could sustain such a relationship with the man she's going to marry. Um, John's mother was the best person that he ever knew. She was office manager for the family business, and two weeks ago she died prematurely of um, cancer at 
47 years of age because it had spread and they didn't catch it in time. And John's dad is 10 years older and has his own health problems and he is lost without his beloved wife and desperately needs John to help out in her absence in the family business, which means that there's not going to be any money or time for him to go back to college. And now both his mother and the dream of a college degree are gone. How's he going to get through all of that? Cindy, planning the wedding of her dreams with a guy she's been dating for over a year. The bridesmaids are picked out. The caterer has been lined up. Uh, the uh, dress has been selected. And it is the most exciting time in her life. And the future looks bright. She needed some addresses for the uh, groomsmen, which were on her fiance's phone lying in his car and when she started going through the phone looking for addresses she found she found some pictures and some text messages some of them not two days old with another woman and all of a sudden the wedding plans to this guy are over and her dreams are shattered and there'll be no wedding and she's condemning herself for being so stupid and for being so blind. The ability of these people to make wise decisions or to sustain meaningful relationships or to endure the, those kind of crushing blows will have to do with how big they are on the inside. It won't have anything to do with how big or small they are on the outside. So we've been talking about inside out living. We've been talking about what it means to be bigger on the inside than on the outside and how you get there. Because God looks on the inside, people look on the outside. We can't see on the inside, so we're left with looking on the outside, uh, which is one of the reasons that men and women make marriage choices that they later come to regret. They pay more attention to what they could see on the outside instead of exploring more of what is actually on the inside. But God also works on the inside. He works where our fears and our prejudices and our anger and our lust and our greed reside. God works with our motivation with our ambitions, with our resentments, with our pride. And those things are where? They're on the inside. Now, I shared with you there are four stages to get to where you want to be if you want to grow on the inside. There's the help me stage, which we looked at last week where a person truly comes to recognize how desperately they need God. And so they cry out for God, and it opens the door for his grace and his help. Um, this morning, I want to look at the second stage. It's there in Psalm 139. Search me, O oh God. It's that search me stage, and I'm wondering if you have had uh, a search me moment in your life. You know, since the World Trade Twin Towers were destroyed um, by terrorists, our government has put in a policy uh, for flying on aircrafts whereby you have to be searched. 
In a couple of weeks, my family's going to fly out to the west and spend a week in Yosemite National Park. And we'll have to get on an airplane. And you know the drill. Before you can get on, they will run you through and have some kind of x-ray machine. Not only your baggage, but also you, because they want to know what's inside before you get on the plane. And that's easy essentially what is involved in this second stage when having cried out to God help me uh, you begin to trust to God enough to ask him to search you and see what's there what darkness needs to be exposed to the light what brokenness needs to be healed what anxiousness and fearfulness needs to be given to him and i'm telling you this morning that a lot of christians never get to this stage and and you know that because you know people that came to the Lord 25 years ago. And you can't see any real change in who they are. They, um, I mean, Paul said, if anyone be in Christ, they're a new creature. Old things are passed away and Behold, everything becomes new, but these people still think the same way. They still act the same way. They have the same old bad habits, the same problems, the same struggles. There are people who never ever get to this second stage. They've never said to God, search me. They've never had a search me moment. Which brings me to Psalm 139. The psalmist is pondering the God of the universe. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, Lord, you know me. You know when I sit down, you know when I get up. Before there's even a word on my tongue, now, that sounds like some old married couples, right? I mean, there's some people who are married and the partner can anticipate what they're going to say before they say it, but God knows before there's a word on your tongue. You know it completely. Not only that, but he says, where, where can I go that you aren't there? If I go up to heaven, you're there. But if I make my bed in the depths, the Hebrew word is sheol. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And then he says, when I was being born, you formed my unformed body. Um, and so he says, search me. God who knows me, God who is everywhere, God who saw when I was put together in the womb, search me, know my heart, test me, see what's inside. Have you ever had a search me moment in your life? Because that's the stage in which you start trusting God to see what's really there. At the end of the first century, churches in Asia Minor, the people in the churches were about to go through a period of persecution and trial. And John has a vision and God's spirit comes to him beforehand and scrutinizes the churches, the people in the churches. 
And he's looking to see if what's inside is big enough to endure what they're going to go through. <laughs> and see, we don't know until whatever it is comes. We've all had the rug pulled out from under us, often when we least expect it, and it's only then we look in the cupboard to see what's inside of us. Is there enough courage? Is there enough wisdom? Is there enough insight? Is there enough hope? Is there enough perseverance? So the Spirit comes to them so they'll know where they need help. After searching Ephesus, he commends them for their hard work and for standing up against wickedness. And then he says, you lost your first love. He commends Pergamum for their faithful witness in the little persecution they'd already been through. But then he tells them, you allowed false teaching to contaminate your church. He tells Thyatira, get rid of Jezebel. And then he tells, lastly, Laodicea, who thought they, they, they were full. <laughs> they didn't need anything. And the Spirit says, in truth, you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He wasn't trying to hurt these churches. He was telling them the truth because he wanted to help them. But he couldn't help them if they didn't know the truth about what was really inside of them so they would know where they needed to grow or repent or change or seek God's healing. By the way, that's where men get off the track. Men want to please their wives. Good men always want to please their wives. And wives are always fighting to get closer to their husbands. And let me tell you how a woman thinks. She's thinking, okay, there's some things that my husband's doing that's hurting me. And if he knew that, he'd want to fix it so we could feel close. So I'm going to tell him. And he's going to say, thank you, sweetheart. I needed to know that. Now, but that's how she's thinking. Right. And so she goes to her husband and he gets all defensive and all upset and he stops listening after the second sentence because he doesn't want to hear what's inside. She's always complaining about something. I can't ever make her happy if he just stop and listen. He'd figure out how to make his own marriage better. When you start asking God to help you, it's because you've developed a level of trust of God and a passion for God that you really want to have him see what's inside because there's a lot of good in us, but there's a lot of stuff that's not so good. And that's the stuff we hide from people and sometimes from ourselves and often from God. And those are the very things God doesn't need to touch the good parts. He can refine them a little. He needs to touch the parts that aren't good. So interesting, Jesus described himself as the truth. You know what that means? I am the truth. He didn't say, I know the truth. But he did. He knew that. He didn't say, um, I can help you find the truth. He said, I am the truth. The truth about what? Well, I mean, the truth about God, when you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. But he was man in his perfect state. So when you look at Jesus, he's the truth, of, he's the truth about us. And if you look at the New Testament through that, through that filter, 
you'll see Jesus trying to tell the truth to people who often didn't want to hear it. He was there um, at Jacob's well talking with a Samaritan woman who had been through five husbands. Now, you don't need to be a trained psychiatrist to know if a woman's been through five husbands, she got a problem. And Jesus was looking on the inside when he said to her, where is your husband? And it wasn't just that this woman couldn't stay married. Jesus wanted her to see that her soul was thirsty and not for water and no amount of husbands was ever going to quench her thirst. He wanted to tell her the truth. Same thing with Peter. We talk about Peter's denial, but do you realize Peter had two denials, not one? We know about the courtyard where he denied to a servant girl that he even knew Jesus, but there was another denial that same night when Jesus told his disciples, you are all going to fall away. And Peter wasn't willing to look inside and see the fear and cowardice that was there. And so instead, he denied it. That's his first denial. I'll never do that. These other ne'er-do-well disciples might, but I never will. And so he was completely unprepared when it happened. When the cock crowed was his search me moment. And you know what he did. He went out and wept bitterly. Why did David lapse into that sordid affair with Bathsheba and then instigate a cover-up that ended up killing the woman's own husband? There was some dark stuff going on in David's life, and I expect he wasn't even fully aware of the kind of spiritual waste of land he had finally gotten to. Dark stuff, maybe emptiness, maybe boredom, maybe middle-age fatigue. I don't know. I'm not sure David know, knew until a prophet named Nathan came to him and said, I need some help. And David said, what? Then I got a problem with this guy. And he describes this man who did some awful things. And David said, well, name him so I can punish him. And Nathan said, it's you. That was David's search me moment. How do I know? Because he writes about it in Psalm 51. Listen. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Wash me of my iniquity, because my sin is now always before me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, for the sacrifice acceptable to you is a contrite heart, a broken spirit. What does God search for? I mean, you say, okay, when you cry out, really search me, what does God search for? The psalmist said, see if there be, and if you read different translations, they have different words. The Hebrew word is otseb, otseb, and otseb can mean pain. It can mean idol. It can mean wickedness. It can mean sorrow. Look inside of me, God, and see if there's something that's hurtful, something that's hurting me, disappointment or fear, or unforgiveness or grief. It just hurts me. Look inside and see if there's something sinful 
Psalm 32 says, When I kept silent about my sins, my bones wasted away. Sin that's unconfessed will kill you spiritually. It'll kill you. Search me, God, and see what sin is lurking there. Um, look inside, Lord, and see what's broken. Show me what needs to be fixed. Is it my tongue? Is it my eyes? Is it the places I go? Is it a friendship that's toxic? Is it my attitude in church? Show me, God. Is it my busyness? Show me, God. Look inside. And what happens when he does? Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. See, that's, that's the words of a person who's had a search me moment. All that is within me. Praise his holy name. Goes on to say, for he heals all my wounds. And he redeems my soul from the pit. And he restores me. And he satisfies me. What does he do? He heals what's hurting us. He releases and redeems what's separating us from God. He restores what is broken. He satisfies, which is a way of saying when you let God search you, it puts you in a better place when he's done. Um... I, I think I never would have gone into the ministry if there hadn't been a search me moment in my life. I was planning to be an engineer and I wanted to be an engineer not because I knew anything at all about engineering but so I could make a good living. But I was a Christian. And I knew that whatever I did, I should choose on the basis of God's guidance and leadership and do what was pleasing to him. And I knew I wasn't doing that. Nobody else knew, but I knew. And one Sunday morning, I was sitting in church like you are, and the pastor was preaching, and. I couldn't sit there any longer. At the invitation, I came to him and I said, Pastor, I'm struggling because my motivations about my future are wrong. And I'm here at the altar to say publicly, whatever God wants me to do, I'll do. And by the way, from that moment, I was free to be an engineer. From that moment, I was free to make a good living, whatever it would pay, and I'd be happy with it. I didn't want to live in poverty, do you? Because from that moment on, God searched me and my motivation was different. It was only when I had that search me moment could God lead me to the next step. I was 10 years into ministry and still holding resentments for my father and the breakup of my parents' home. And, you know, I didn't even know it was there. And God searched me. And he said, do you want to spend the rest of your life with that resentment. You love your dad. Do you want that to be a barrier so you can't ever move forward? And that was the search me moment that released a lot of pain in my life. If you're ever going to grow on the inside, 
you have to come to a place where you trust God enough after you say, help me, to say, search me. Go ahead, Lord, look down into my heart. Look at all the painful stuff, all the sinful stuff, all the hurtful stuff, all of the idolatrous stuff. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart and see what's there. And then lead me in the everlasting way. What is keeping you from that search me moment? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, there's no secret why we often don't grow, why we remain so small on the inside, exposed when some main decision comes and we don't know what to do, or when relationships are not working and we don't know how to sustain them, or when we're crushed by life and we're trying to recover and we find that the only thing in the cupboard is despair. Help us, Lord, to move to that search me moment and open our hearts for you to see, to show us all that is in us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 544. Um, could there be a more appropriate uh, hymn? Have thine own way, Lord. That's another way of saying search me. If you're not a Christian today, um, I want to invite you to come to the altar. And I'll have my mask on. But just at the altar, publicly say, I'm a sinner. I know I'm not saved, and I know I need Jesus. And I want to go from here. Scripture says if you'll do that, he'll come into your life and begin to make all things new. You say, I'm just not comfortable coming to the altar with this virus, then catch me after the service or someone else and say, I want to get saved. I'm not sure how, but I want to get saved. If you're a Christian and you want to make this your church home, um, come to the altar and say, I've been baptized, I've trusted the Lord, I, I want to make this the place where I serve. And this church will receive you on the basis of believer's baptism or a transfer of a church letter. Or catch me outside before you go and say, I'm not a member, but I'd like to be. We can help you. But you got to take the first step. If you need prayer, and here at the altar, I'll pray with you, you come. Let's stand together as we sing. Have thine own way, Lord.
that we might clothe himself. For Christ's sake, amen.